Auburn's running back room may be the same from a year ago, but the way it could be used could be tremendously different. You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby, and thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen Every single day, we are dapping it up on this Wednesday. Montgomery radio legend, Daryl Daprich, hanging out with us. We'll discuss more depth chart pieces involving the defensive backs. And also, all signs are pointing towards Auburn adding a tight end, another tight end to that 2025 class. Heck, by the time this is up, he may be committed. We'll see. We'll see. But Daryl, let's start things off talking about the running back situation. Because... Even though the room is the same, I think the pecking order, the depth chart, and the usage for all of these guys is going to be different than a year ago. I agree 100%. And because I am a regular listener, an everydayer of Locked on Auburn, when I was watching you and Charlie Five yesterday talk about the 2023 class Mm. and and who was going to make an impact, I was squirming in my seat a little bit because, as you know, from the beginning, because I'd seen so many games of his in person, you like I just Cobb. think I, I just think Jeremiah Cobb is a victim of a great room, and and he probably makes more of an impact than he he probably could make more of an impact than those other guys you were talking about because of necessity. So you yeah. guys were right on right on beat with that. But but to me, I just think he's so special and can be utilized in a much more I don't know impactful way this year. Mm-hmm. And I know that means jumping over guys like Batty and Austin because, I mean, your Hunter is your bell cow. But I just want to see a bigger role in him move up in the pecking order this year. Yeah, and that's the question is how many spots can Jeremiah Cobb move up this offseason? A year ago, we were so excited about Brian Batty, and I still think there's a reason to be excited about Brian Batty. I do think he brings some things to the room that these other guys don't have. But we talked about it. Last offseason, it's like, okay, of these four guys, Jarquez Hunter, Brian Batty, Damari Austin, Jeremiah Cobb, we'll sprinkle in Sean Jackson. People get mad when I don't say Sean Jackson enough. But when you look at these four guys, slash five, if you want to count Sean Jackson, there was going to be a guy that was going to be left out. And for the most part, it was Jeremiah Cobb. That equation did change a little bit because Damari Austin was hurt for some time last year. And so I I think it kind of allowed more guys to get some action, but Daryl this year, like Brian Batty could be that guy. Mm -hmm. He entered the portal. You got to think that the interest in him wasn't as high as he thought it was going to be, or he probably wouldn't have entered the portal or was this a mutual thing? And they say, Hey, maybe we can go get somebody else. And they didn't, I don't know, but regardless um, Brian Batty was not made a priority over the course of the offseason or he wouldn't have entered the portal. I don't think that's a crazy thing to say. And you've got to feel good about everybody in this room. You love the Jarquez Hunters coming back. Oh, yeah. You love Damari Austin. And then obviously Jeremiah Cobb going into his second year of SEC play. The pecking order is not going to be the same. Daryl, and you asked the question, you hinted at it. How much can Jeremiah Cobb move up? I think he passes Brian Batty And I think the battle between him and Damari Austin for RB2 is going to be very exciting and very engaging this offseason. You're 100% dead on. I have him moving two spots. You're going to go, what? He's going to unseat Austin? No. I think there's going to be a 2A and a 2B. I think he passes Batty, and I think Mm -hmm. you're going to literally have Austin and Cobb have similar touches and carries. So if if that's the case, you can't drop one to third. It's 2A and 2B. And situationally, I think Cobb probably plays more in passing downs with jet sweeps and wheel routes and that kind of thing because he's elite downfield receiving and probably Austin more on obvious running downs because he carried the water for Auburn some last year. While the well, Not only when Jarquez Hunter was, Hunter was out, when Jarquez Hunter was taking his time to get right. Remember, mm-hmm. it took three or four games for us to see the Jarquez Hunter we saw from the previous year. In, right. that, in that stretch, Alston carried the mail and carried the weight for, for Auburn. So uh, I think that's how you're going to see it. I think Hunter's probably more himself, more explosive, more impactful right out of the shoot this year mm-hmm. because no suspensions and playing your way back in. 
And I think Austin and Cobb become situationally 2A and 2B. And then Batty and Jackson take their place in line after that. Yeah, so Auburn ran 513. There were 513 Auburn rush attempts last year. I think that number is going to stay about the same because I think Auburn is going to run more plays overall, but I think those extra plays are going to be passing attempts. Just a hunch. It's my guess. We can debate that another time if you disagree. But when you look at the 513 carries, Jarquez led the way with 159. Peyton Thorne had 134. I think that number goes down. Damari had 64. Brian Batty had 51. I think that number drops tremendously. And then Robbie Ashford had 46. I think that role, unless Sam, I just can't see Sam Jackson, even if he has that role, get having 46 rushing attempts. I just have a no. hard time picturing that. If he does, it, it, you got to think he becomes some explosive runner that you know we'd be okay with. But I have a hard time seeing that be the case. The Jeremiah Cobb, Jeremiah Cobb had 33. And then everybody else had less than, uh, they were all had less than 10. So over under on how many touches he gets, I say plus 50, I say 50 more. 50 more. So you no, can, you, no, hold on. He got 33. I'm going to say he gets 64 this year. I think that's so, too low. I think that's too low. So, oh, so you, you think he could get 50 or more than I the think, over. I think 85 touches for Jeremiah Cobb's a good number. That's, that's awesome. So the plus minus the over under for you would be 50 plus 50. The, that's good. I mean, do you think Peyton Thorne runs it 134 times? I do. No, I think oh. he runs it about 100 and 110. I still think okay, so about that, that is going to be. About yeah, I same. still think that is going to be a huge component of Auburn's uh, offensive attack. I think out of necessity, um, he's going to have to run it. Not yeah. maybe not as much. Maybe okay. those maybe those those 30 carries that he got before are now throws. Because I agree with you. I think the pie. That was total plays last year. It's bigger. It's bigger. Yeah. But the percentage of that stays the same. So therefore, it makes sense that the numbers of each go up, but the percentage stays the same. I think Peyton Thorne still runs it. It's too. It's too integral to Auburn's Auburn's offensive output. He Auburn was very effective when he ran it effectively, moving the ball. I don't. I, you don't want to go away from that. When Peyton Thorne was running the ball, when he ran the ball effectively, Auburn moved the ball. I mean, yeah. he really, they I really got, did. No, I get it. So, so I, I don't it. know, you know, when he stayed in the pocket and looked like a deer in headlights and got sacked, it's different. But design runs, I think Georgia, Alabama, you know, Vanderbilt, he really did a good job when he was called upon for the design runs. He he was a more effective runner than I thought. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I, I, I think it comes down a little bit. But one thing that will go is, you know, the backup quarterback rushing attempts. So f those are 46 runs by Robbie that are available, and if you split those in half, Damari is around 80-ish, Jeremiah Cobb's around 50-ish, and I just, I think Peyton Thorne's rushing attempts go down a little bit, and I think those go to Cobb. Another way I could see this going is Jarquez Hunter is the starter, Damari Austin is the backup, and Jeremiah Cobb is just the guy on the field on third downs regardless of what part of the game you're in, that that would not shock me. Because let's just call a spade a spade here. Auburn has to get better at converting on third down. They mm -hmm. have to. They have to. And a guy like Jeremiah Cobb, I think, helps you do that because he can do more than the other two guys can as far as being a threat to receive and being a threat to run. I don't think he's as good of a pass protector as those other two guys are, but I think you can work on that this off season. So that could that be makes, just kind of another, another way that they use Cobb. I hope they do. I think that'd be a great way to utilize him. I'm afraid though, that if they get to third and two and third and one, he won't get on the field on third downs. So under your scenario, I would love to leave him on the field third and two. I suspect the temptation is going to be, Oh, it's third and two get Hunter back out there to push the pile and get the first down. Yeah. Brian Batty, 51 rushes a year ago. What would you set his over under at? 25? I, 25. I was going to say between 25 and 30 is the touches I think okay. he's going to get. Yeah. Right. The, the key thing that you said that doesn't need to be glossed over that's really important is the Robbie Ashford touches that go bye-bye that other people just by default are going to get now. and get, Those are you know, inefficient runs too. 
most yeah. of them. I mean, that yeah. really messed the offense up at times. It did. And so you're not going to have those anymore. And I don't think Thorne gets those, right? I don't think the scenarios, maybe he gets some. I don't know. Maybe I don't when, think when he, he got pulled when he got pulled out of the game, sometimes at third and six from the from the seven yard line, and people are like, leave him in. Maybe now he stays in. Is that guy Sam Jackson? I don't think so. I think he's going to be more along the lines of a of a of a you know a receiver type in that scenario. So mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. So, yeah, what are your thoughts? What do you think the pecking order for Auburn running backs is? Leave those in the comments or hit us up on social media. Genuinely curious. The defensive back room, as far as projecting the pre-spring depth chart, talked about this before. I need your help, Daryl. I need your help with this because where do you put Keontae Scott? We discuss in just a moment right here. Unlocked on Auburn. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Game Time. Game Time is the best place to buy live tickets. And um, we're getting down to it, but it's definitely the place to buy uh, tickets to the big game as well, if you're into that. So it's fast. It's easy. Um, it doesn't matter if it's for sports, music, comedy, theater events. Um, Daryl, you've used Game Time. You love Game Time. I it's love super it. great. Yes, I love it. I've used it for sports and concerts i'm going to a big concert in atlanta in july and i didn't even have to get off my app went right wow. to the same app that i get you know sporting events with as well so it's, it's really convenient and i love the virtual seating compared to stage and field it matters totally. when you're in stadiums right so what? i just let people try it they'll see what i'm talking about yeah take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time right now all game time users get a hundred dollars off a big game ticket with code vegas 100 or if you're not going to the big game, use code Locked On, all one word, L O C K E D O N, Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Daryl, when you look at the running back room, I may I'm going to compare Keontae Scott to Caleb Burton. And when I talked about Caleb Burton a few days ago with Lindsey, said okay, it's easy to kind of map out a few of these pieces, like the receivers. You feel good about Cam Coleman starting at one of the outside spots. I feel good about Kaden Lee starting at one of the outside corner spots. But after that, it kind of depends on how this coaching staff is going to use Keontae Scott. And just talking to folks at the Senior Bowl, um, I I think there was an article that Nathan King at Auburn Undercover put out his interview with, I think it was with Pritchett, but talked about how stoked he was that Keontae Scott's playing outside corner. And so... uh, I don't think he's going to end up playing outside corner. That's just my gut reaction, but we'll see. They may give him the old college try, but I think the staff is going to find that he is too valuable and too important. And I think the NFL is probably going to get into his ear to some extent too, saying we want you in the middle of the field. So if that's the case, it's huge for Antonio kite, the former Alabama corner that is now transferred in and is on campus. But to me, you can't, you can't predict or project this defensive back room until you guess where Keontae Scott is going to play. You know, it's well documented. Uh, even if it wasn't, you would make sure that you let people know that I flipped on this. And I yeah. flipped because originally I flipped because of Kite. That was the first thing. I mean, it, let's be honest. Do you think that he comes to Auburn to sit? No, he's leaving right. Alabama, for God's sakes. He's not going to. He's not going to leave Alabama to come to Auburn and, and, and ride the pine. So I think that he's expecting to start at one of the outside corners with Lee, therefore moving Scott inside. Part two of that equation, if I needed any more convincing, was talking to the scout that we talked to at the Senior Bowl. If you have an NFL scout coaches telling you, hey, there's a lot of money to be made if you stay in the middle of the field, this is your future, you move to the middle of the field. So I think those two factors – Kite coming to Auburn and probably projected at the next level at a higher pick, making more money inside like that to the middle of the field is why I think he starts at one, leaves the other, and your backups are rim and hood. Yeah, and and we'll see where exactly he lines up, and we'll probably see it pretty early. Um, Mm -hmm. But they're going to put him at multiple spots, you'd have to think, over the course of spring just to kind of give other guys reps. But I just I love the safety room. I absolutely love it. It's, you know, you feel good about nickel as well if Keontae is there. Yeah. And I, and I think you feel good about the, I feel better about the corner room than I do the nickel room 
And so to me, that means you should put Keontae Scott where you're more thin. That's just my line of thinking. But once again, we don't know everything. Like Keontae Scott could have said, hey, I will come back if you let me play outside corner. We don't know what that conversation was, Daryl. But, I mean, the the players at the Senior Bowl seem to think he's playing outside corner still. And I, I think that is telling. If he moves back inside at the nickel, I still think you have viable options to back him up in Caleb Wooden and um, Champ Anthony. I think those two guys mm. have showed they can play that position and back up Scott. And then, like I mentioned, Rim and Hood could back up Lee and Kite. Your safety room, which we love, if you start Thompson and Robinson, you still have your boy, Sylvester Smith, and somebody that I think is kind of like being – I don't know, a foregone conclusion is Puckett. I mean, he, he announced, did he not announce that he's coming back? I didn't see that. I thought he did, and that's what clarification, but I thought Zion Puckett was coming back. I don't think I saw him. Like, maybe he did. Maybe I'm confused. Some of this stuff. I think he declared late. for the draft. Okay, well, if he did, then you've got Wooden as another backup safety potential. Um, and then the other kid, too, is Terrence Love, who don't sleep on him. I think he could play safety. And, and be a, a viable for depth as well. People are really high on him. Uh, yeah, and, and Puckett did. On, on January 1st, he put out a graphic saying thank you to the Auburn family, okay. saying he was okay. declaring. So that was one of those that just really was under the radar, and it just kind of slipped through. But so, mm -hmm. And then you don't know if any freshmen you know, are going to be able to come in and, and get on the field and get in the, in the two or three deep right away um, from a safety position. But, uh, you know, J. Who C. would that Hart. be? Like who who would who would a freshman be that could do that? Like is Kinsey Faustin? That's the one I was thinking of. I've heard a lot of people say, "Don't sleep on him. He's got tools and attributes that he could play. Mm -hmm. He's very advanced uh, in his fall as far as picking up defenses and physical attributes. He could be ready to go. He's a guy you were real high on. I, I'm trying to think of the other. Was it Lewis, the corner? Uh, no, mm -hmm. um, I like Crawford a lot. Crawford. Or Jalen Crawford, who he's more of a corner, though. Get, yeah, as a corner, could still yeah. get into the in the two or three deep. So, um, again, I, I like JC Hart. I, you know, I haven't heard anything about him. This is just, I think, year three, and I thought he was going to be more of an impact. He has in special teams. Maybe he finds a, a home at, at slot at, at mm -hmm. nickel, and he could be that third dude in the rotation. So, there's a lot we'll see in spring. We'll tell the tale, as you said. Once we see Scott. Wherever Scott lines up, the dominoes and the pieces will fall into place after that. Yeah, and they may use him to do multiple things, which will be telling. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think Keontae Scott is going to be the first piece in this defense. And of course, I think Kay and Lee's pretty much set as an outside corner as well. Auburn close, or maybe by the time this is up, has already added another tight end to the 2025 class. What does that mean for the future of this Auburn offense? We discuss in just a moment right here on Locked On Auburn. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Daryl, you love the Super Bowl. I love the Super Bowl. Sports fans love the Super Bowl. Daryl's got the Niners. I've got the Chiefs. And if you feel one way or the other strongly, you need to head over to FanDuel. They've got so many ways for you to end the football season with a dub or two or three. Not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. Mahomes rushing touchdown, calling it now. New customers join today. You'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more Wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of the NFL, and the Locked On Podcast Network. Daryl Auburn landing Hollis Davidson, the tight end from Peachtree City, Georgia. It seems imminent. It seems like it will happen. Um, at any point, it could be right after the show goes up. It could be a few hours after we get done recording, but we're going to have this conversation under the assumption that he is coming here soon. 6'6", 230. You can't really look at the rankings quite yet because he's not ranked by everyone. Rivals very high on him. Rivals has him as a ninth-ranked tight end in the 2025 class. On three has not ranked him 
yet. So all of the composite stuff is going to be off until everybody kind of figures out what they want to do with him. But there's a lot to like about Hollis Davidson. Seems to move well with a frame of 6'6", 230. Yeah, as our good friend Charlie Five pointed out to me when I was saying, you know, this seems like a lot of Auburn. Auburn's going after a lot of tight ends. Mm -hmm. Forgetting that Collins was somebody that we didn't get in that class, whether Auburn backed off or not. And that Auburn loses right. three tight ends, right, in Fairweather, Deal, and – and uh, Frazier, who at the I end really of this like. year. At right. the end of this year. I think Frazier's going to have a nicer role this year, by the way, too. So they yeah. go out and get get G, Ryan G, right? Uh, he's a kid from 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 Georgia. They get the the walk-on, Hunter uh, Owsley, is how you pronounce it, from, from Clanton, who I've heard at some point probably by the end of this year might be ranked as well. People, Both of those dudes are like 6'4", 230. So what you get in Davidson is a 6'6". 230 tight, tight end, a bigger cat, kind of like Frazier. Uh, and again, you know, Rivals does have him as a four star on three, has not ranked him. We'll yeah. see where it ends up. I look at offer lists a lot. We've talked about that as well. I, I look at that as much as stars and Tennessee, Georgia Tech, Florida, and Florida State have all offered this kid. Um, so Auburn doing a good job of filling up its tight end room, tight end a position, Zach, for me that. I don't think you really need to go out and get five-star tight ends. If they fall in your lap, that's great. I think you could really do a lot of damage with three- and four-star tight ends. I think they really serve a purpose if you throw to them. Yeah. And Auburn has gotten back into that mode of throwing to the tight end. They have, and and you got to think that Micah Riley Ducker will have a role in this. Excuse me, we're calling him Micah Riley now. My apologies. But I think Micah Riley will have – a role in this is kind of being Fairweather's true backup. And then let's don't forget about the transfer tight end they picked up, Rico Walker, who mm -hmm. is a guy that's athletic, kind of a lot of unknowns, but you look at his frame and you look at his ability and what he did at Maryland in a limited role. Could you see that evolving over the course of the next two seasons, especially with not, you can't imagine he's going to be asked to do too much this year. So I think you, I think you love the future of the tight end position at Auburn. But I do think, I don't think it's been ideally like bridged, if that makes sense. Like you're losing too much at once. And then it's like, okay, here you go. Uh, a bunch of new faces. And I think the age is going to be split up because Mike O'Reilly will be a veteran by that point, And Rico Walker will have, you know, multiple years of college football with, with these young guys potentially coming in. So, uh, I think it makes sense. I think it makes sense to some extent, but I do think as this staff is here longer and longer, the bridge won't be as dramatic with losing all of those guys at the same time, like you pointed out. The good thing about bridging that transition is the portal allows you to do that. In years past, you would have had to sign three freshmen like Auburn's doing. Yeah. You wouldn't have gotten Walker. And then just hope and pray that with Mike O'Reilly and these three dudes that somebody would emerge. Well, now you got Walker, and you've always got the option next year after all three graduate. If you don't feel comfortable about it just being Walker and Riley being the veterans, you can do like you did with Fairweather and go out and get a seasoned veteran tight end in the portal to bridge that gap. That's always an option now that you didn't have three or four years ago. Right. No question. No question. So, Hollis Davidson expected to be a part of Auburn's class when it's all said and done. A lot of the crystal balls have come in. You also saw um, some of the Auburn coaching staff um, doing their version of their bat signals and all that. So you got to think it's Hollis Davidson. The 6'6 tight end from McIntosh in Peachtree City, Georgia. Daryl, you and I will be live tonight after yes. Auburn takes on Alabama. Of course, Auburn looking to get some revenge and uh we'll be live right here on the locked on auburn youtube channel imagine the light show that'll be shown tonight if auburn holds serve at home and wins uh it'll be it could be glorious of a light show what do you think it could uh yeah. I, th I think it'll be worthy of one if yeah. auburn pulls it off no question no question and uh, six o'clock tip praise god woohoo man goodness, that's man. oh my goodness i was so thankful for that you know i mean that's that's nice. I mean, yeah. That is nice compared to what all the yeah. So, so we'll go live around eight fifteen, eight thirty, depending on how it's officiated and how long the broadcast goes. But um, we'll also drop that in audio form as soon as we're done as well. So be sure to check that out. However, you consume this show, Daryl. How else can people check out everything you've got going on? Follow me on X uh, DAP sixty four ten. 
And then I'm with you also on Fridays and Monday mornings and Tuesday afternoons on various shows on the Auburn Network if you want to check that out. Yeah. Uh, once again, just like this video and please subscribe to uh, to the channel. And we'll see you later this evening. This has been Locked on Auburn.